If you haven't been with us, we're talking about grace and its power through God to overcome sin. That's our lesson this morning. We're talking about the price of grace, lesson four. And before we get started, if everyone's set, let's go to God in prayer at this time. Our loving and heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we can come to you as a group of Christians together this morning and study the word that you have preserved through all these centuries for us. And we thank you that you allow us to have this fellowship here and to think about you and to speak with you and commune with you. Our Father, this morning as we talk about the price of grace, help us to realize just how high that price was and the fact that you were more than willing to pay it for us. Father, we are thankful for the effect in our lives that that price has each and every day. And we, we pray that as we go out from this place with newfound knowledge or newfound reminders, that we would live according to the grace that you have bestowed upon us. Be with our hearts, give us hearts of understanding, open hearts that will accept your word and not reject it based upon our own presuppositions or our own desires. Father, this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So this morning we are talking about the price of grace. Our first lesson was about God's grace. Well, actually I forget what it was called. But anyway, this, this morning we're talking about the price of grace. And we'll go ahead and start, if you have your material, with that case study, just to get us set with an image in our minds to talk about this price of grace. So if you have your material, look on page 9, that's the front page, and we'll go ahead and start reading. It says, Elias was returning to Bethany from Jerusalem. It hadn't been one of those prescribed feast days, but he was a devout man. He understood the law, and he knew he was a sinner. He was ashamed to think of the lies he had told, the coveting he had indulged in, the uncleanness he had brought upon himself. At the end of each month, he considered his sins and offered the sin sacrifice. He could not afford a bowl, so he took one of his best and most promising lambs from the flock and headed for Jerusalem. When Elias slit its throat, he winced. The blood flowed everywhere. Even now, Elias grimaced at the image and was a little surprised at his response. How many lambs had he slaughtered because of his sins? Perhaps he, if he could remember that image before he sinned, he would turn away from them. But sin had a price. The soul who sins shall die, Ezekiel had written. Elias was glad God graciously allowed for the sacrifice instead of his own death. But why did sin have to cost so much? Elias thought he might ask that new teacher, John, the guy who had baptized him in the Jordan. He had said that baptism was one of, the, was one of repentance for the remission of sins. If his sins were remitted, why keep sacrificing? He decided to go find John the next day. When Elias found John, a crowd was already there, but he was teaching and baptizing. Before Elias could get to him, John looked up and pointed to a man coming toward them. Elias remembered seeing John baptize the man. It was odd because John actually had said that man should baptize him. Today, John cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What, thought Elias, the Lamb of God? What is John talking about? Is he saying this man is a sacrifice like my lambs? How can you take away the sins of the world? What is all this about? Does he have to die because of my sins? What on earth did John mean? So we have once again a very vivid, relatable study in some ways about the price of sin, especially under the old covenant. And our first question goes right along with that. It says, what was the cost of Elias' sin's under the Old Covenant. I hear something? Dwayne? Is the, the death of a lamb? The shedding of blood? Yeah. There's a verse in Hebrews that says, without blood there can be no remission of sins. And so as Dwayne said, the cost of sins under the Old Law was the death of an animal, varying depending on the wealth of the sinner. And the second part of that question is, why wasn't that enough? Why wasn't that price enough. When he paid for his sin with the blood of an animal, why didn't that really pay for his sin? Alex? Animals don't have the choice to sin. 
just don't sin because they were designed by God to not sin. They don't have free will like you and I do. We have to choose to sin or not sin. Okay, yeah. They, they don't understand the law of right and wrong, and where there is no law, there is no sin, as it says in Romans. So you're exactly right. They don't have the capability to sin. They're not sinful like us, Alan. There's such a thing as called unintentional sin, and it has sin that were like if you didn't have uh, you could afford a land, uh, you, I think you went to the list and say that over, you'll find a lot of things that are very confusing. And also, the Bible has always talked about the great mystery, but that's been resolved. So now Christ one death died once for all. Any other reasons why the death of an animal was not enough? I think we had a Dwayne. Go ahead. It just covers over the sin; it doesn't forgive or atone. Right. There is the reminders. It says every year of sins. Um, actually, I think we have that passage here um, at the beginning in Hebrews chapter ten and verse. One, beginning, it kind of talks about this. It says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would, not longer, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, as Dwayne made mention. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So as we saw, there is just a reminder of the sins every year. It is the reminder that your sins produce death. And in the Old Covenant, the only, the only provision made for that was animals dying in your place. Of course, God in his grace in the Old Testament didn't require immediately the death of everyone who sinned. But surely there was a great deal of loss of life in the Old Testament. And our second question kind of talks about that. If you had been, he, if you had been Elias, it says, hearing about Jesus as the Lamb, how would you have felt about your sins? Shameful. Shameful. I think that's how most of us would feel. Because when you think about the price that we had to pay, or people had to pay in the Old Covenant for their sins, it says, it reminds us in this text, and it says in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 29, that the person who sinned, who offered the animal, had to kill the animal themselves. And so, as you kill that animal, you're thinking, this is because of what I did. This animal loses its life because of my sins. And so when you think of Jesus coming in as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world, as, as John was saying and preaching to those people in that early day, you, you realize that your sins are being transferred to him, or at least that was the point of that analogy as, as Jesus as the Lamb of God. What, how would you feel if you realized that a man that you could see, especially in Elias' case, hypothetically, probably not a real person, but you could see that this man was the person who would have to die for your sins. What would that be like? Surely that would be heartbreaking for us, shameful for us. And he's, uh, Elias says in this text, perhaps he could remember that image, that image of him slaying those animals, slaying all those lambs. If he could remember that image before he sinned, surely he would turn away from those sins. And so if we knew that our sins were going to kill this man, that because of our sins, this perfect man had to die, surely looking at that, we could have that image in our minds and, and think, this is what my sin costs. Going to question three, it says, according to Leviticus chapter 4 and 29, Elias killed the sacrificial lamb himself. We mentioned that already. What does this highlight about our relationship with our sacrificial lamb? Jason. 
I would think that it really drives home the idea of personal accountability. Mm -hmm. That this animal that I'm coming in contact with is dying because of the choices that I and only I have made. I think you're right. And when we think about, oh, go ahead, Alan. I, I ordered a, a book called Walk with God, and the same guy wrote this, this, this lesson. And, and, and I've read it yesterday, and, and uh, there's only two people that walk with God, he and Noah, that I can find. And that must be something that in their lives, what they did. You can read about Noah, a lot more you can't even. But that's the type of person that you should be trying to follow. Them. All I had on their mind was God. Let's give an example. Stephen, I was thinking in our songbook, we sing a song called I'm the One. And every time we sin, we're the ones that, you know, crucify the Lord. We're the ones that we're actually sacrificing our Lord. And it's the same thing that they were feeling, or should have been feeling, in the old law when they were sacrificing animals. That because of their sin, they had to do this. They had to go through this. And it's the same thing today when we sin against our God. Because we're the ones that are sacrificing Jesus on that cross. Right. When we understand that personal accountability, that personal cost of our sins, really that, that has a big effect on us. And so as we look and compare the Old Covenant with the New Covenant, we see that under the Old Covenant, the cost was the price of a lamb, a lamb without blemish and without spot. But of course, as we mentioned before, that price wasn't enough. It couldn't take away sins. And so the cost was the death of a man, and not just a man, but a perfect man, God himself. David? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, along the lines of what Jason said about personal accountability, and we, we also are dependent upon it. Uh, animals are dumb. Jesus was God's son. I mean, this puts it in a whole different uh, lead. And, and so, if we think about uh, Hebrews 6 and verse 6, it says, and then had fault that talking about those who had fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding up uh, to contempt. So, uh, so our sins is what killed Jesus. And if we fall back into sin, that's our practice. It's like crucifying him all over again. It's, I mean, it's. To see an animal die is one thing. To see a human die, mm -hmm. to see the Son of God die, but that's completely different. And, and we, we're dependent upon that sacrifice because without Christ's blood, we have no forgiveness. And to remember that that sacrifice is sufficient once for all to take away all of our sins. So we see that cost, that incredible cost of God Himself coming to die for our sins, that price that was paid. Why was that price so high? Why did God have to die for us in that display of grace? Alex. As we reiterated throughout the entire Bible, the price for sins is death. Mm -hmm. So either we had to die on account of our sins, or someone else had to die in our place. God, our God is a just God. Um, the only reason animals could have eaten the sacrifice in the first place was God made a provision till the right time for Jesus to come and mm -hmm. die for the world's sacrifice. <laughs> exactly right. And so we see, as, as Alex just mentioned, that the wages of sin is death. The price or the cost of sin is death. But God offered his free gift for eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. But why did Christ have to die? Why did God have to die? Why was the price of sin that high? And I think if we remember back to the, the last quarter of our study, if you were there, talking about the nature of God, we talked about God's fierce wrath. We talked about just how intense that wrath can be towards sin and all the, all the horrific things that God did in response to sin. And what we 
really pressed in that discussion was the fact that God's wrath, as fierce as it is, as, as terrifying as it is, that's simply God's proper reaction towards sin as a holy being. And so to respond to sin, he used an equally intense form of grace, as intense as his wrath or even more so. He spilled out his grace for us on the cross through Jesus Christ. And so as we think of that immense cost, as we think about the price of Jesus dying, we understand that there are perhaps two dangers when we think about this grace. And the first is that we don't understand the cost. Sometimes people think of grace as sort of a free pass for sin. So Christ came and he died and he suffered so that we could be clean, so that we could be forgiven of our sins. And some people like to think of grace in such a way that God's going to cover our mistakes. And we don't have to really worry or, or do anything different because God's grace has completely enveloped us through Christ. His blood continues to wash our soul clean. And I think the key mistake underlying that, that false idea about grace is a failure to really understand the cost of our sin. Because even, even under the Old Covenant, you could see the cost of your sin when you slit the animal's throat, or when you kill the animal, however they did it. But that imagery of, of self-accountability, that personal accountability, is kind of lost on us because we don't have to physically respond with the taking of a life when we sin or for our sins. And so how can we make it, how can we shape our minds? <clears throat> what can we do to better understand the cost of our sins? How can we better understand the price that was paid? Alan, do you have a thought? John, John our reading of, uh, of Noah. Noah was very close, close to God. And I think, after God seen what happened in the, Eden, in the garden out of Eden, God's righteousness was upset. And I believe that the righteousness from God took place in the death of his son on the cross. And so doing, we are made whole again when we're baptized, a new creature. And I think that's what God is concerned about for each and every one of us. That if we go to heaven, we'll be a righteous person. Because God intends for not to be like what happened in heaven. But God probably knew what would happen. He didn't set that in motion for that to happen. Stephen, did you have a thought? Yeah, uh, I think it's also so very important to build on that personal relationship with Jesus. I mean, it's that personal, intimate relationship in prayer that is essential to understand things when you do sin on just how severe it is. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. If we don't have a personal relationship with God, when we sin against God and we sin and require Jesus' blood, that doesn't really mean anything to us because we don't really understand our relationship with God. We don't really understand what he's doing for us. But when we build that relationship with prayer and study on a daily basis, we become more closely connected with God. And then in that moment, we realize as we see his his blessings through our life, as we th see the things that he's done for us, we realize just exactly what we're doing to him. And I think that's a really good point. I saw Dwayne's hand and then Alex. Right there to your left. <clears throat> Every Sunday, you know, we have that reminder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember my girls as young as two and three asking, is that Jesus? <clears throat> you know, we don't sugar. We don't try to hide or, or fluff you know, what that represents and what that means. I mean, you know, the Old Testament, they had an annual <coughs> reminder by the taking of, of a life, but we, you know, and God's wisdom shows that. We have a, we have a weekly reminder that we're commanded to partake of, where, where we, we remind ourselves every single week, 
we're partaking of Jesus' body, we're partaking of Jesus' blood. And to me, that really helps me to remember each and every week exactly what it is that I've done, exactly what it was that that was given for me. Um, and, you know, for me, I think that's, that's a more powerful reminder than, than a once-a-year killing of an animal that each and every week, you know, we're commanded to partake of the I, I think that's God's wisdom that he reminds us every week. This, this was the cause. Yeah. And, of course, the frequency of that reminder shows us just how important it is to keep that at the forefront of our minds. Very good point. Alex and then Ken. Something that I try to think about during the Lord's Supper or when I'm going in prayer to God is we're told in the Bible that the greatest expression of love is from life to after his life for a fellow friend. And I don't know of any friends I have aside from Jesus that have laid down their lives for me. I think, at least for me, keeping that at the forefront of my mind does help me when I go in prayer to God or when I taking the Lord's Supper, because it really puts in context what Jesus sacrificed for all of us. Mm -hmm. Right, just keeping that sacrifice in our minds, not only here, but also as we leave this building, as we go about our daily activities in life, keeping that sacrifice at the forefront of our mind, because that is the reason we are Christians. That is the reason we have salvation. Ken? Yeah, Alex kind of said what I was going to say, but I think every time we bow our heads to our Lord, our God, Heavenly Father, we should not take that as, hey, I just must do this before I eat. We thank you. Truly thank you for what we have. And most of all, thank you for his son Jesus, who was willing to shed his blood on our behalf. Exactly right. Good questions. I'm sorry, good comments, good suggestions. Any other ways in which we might make this accountability more real? Well, once again, good suggestions. Now, the other half of that danger with grace, the other danger when we think about grace is Sometimes, I'm sure many of us have felt this, if we really do understand just how heinous it was when we sinned, sometimes the guilt of that sin can bear down on us so hard that we don't think there's anything that can forgive us. We think our sins were so enormous and our sins were so filthy that we are just lost forever and we're terrible people. And, and then we, we lose the ability to depend on God's grace. What can we do with that danger, practically, to understand that, that we don't need to, to feel that guilt that would, even after we've repented, even after we have accepted God's grace, we don't need to feel as if there's no hope for us, no forgiveness for our sins. Any suggestions there? Dwayne. So, for me, I think that's one of the reasons that God gave us the example of uh, Saul and his conversion of Paul is I, I look at that and I frame a lot of my personal sins and I look at Saul's life and the things that he did and the persecution of the church and the fact that he was involved in um, you know, murdering and, and, and persecuting the, the young Christian church and, and you look at that and, and the way that God used him and the things that God did for him and, and you think okay well God was able to forgive him <laughs> you know, and, and just the fact that if you let your mind expound on that, you can realize that, you know, this is the same God we're talking about who created the heavens and the earth. And if God wants to forgive you, he can forgive you. I mean, there, there, there's not a limitation to what he's going to do. So to me, it's, it's kind of a twofold thought. The first thing is, like, you know, we have this example of Saul for a reason because he was a, a very heinous person. Before his conversion, he was, he was a zealot. He loved God, but he did all the wrong things. The first, and he was forgiven. And then you, you know, said, well, the second part is just looking at the fact that if God wants to forgive you, He's going to forgive you. And who am I to doubt that that's going to happen? Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons God chose Paul. And there's a statement. I'll paraphrase because I don't know exactly how it goes. But there's a statement in First Timothy, I believe, when Paul's writing to him, he says. This is a faithful saying, Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost, or of whom I am chief. And so, note, remember that all sins are equal, but as Duane said, look to that example of Saul and the way that God forgave him and used him. And that can help us to 
understand that God's grace is great enough for us. I saw Alex's hand and then Elaine. I was following along with my study. I personally know that you have two kinds of studies uh, that are interested in conversion. You have someone that doesn't truly realize the weight of sin that is over them, and you have someone that is drowning in the guilt of their sin. Jesus' mission statement, as he said, was to come and seek and save the lost. Who is the better uh, right ground for conversion than someone who is literally drowning in their sins? That, to me, is going to be the easier person to convert than the one who recognizes things that they have heard, but doesn't truly realize the weight that is hanging over them. That's a good point. Anyway? Um, I was just going to say that for me, I feel like at the heart of guilt is fear. Fear that you won't be accepted by God or by other people. Fear that you're not good enough to be saved. And so whenever I feel that way, I think of the verse in 1 John um, 4, where um, 1 John 14, where it says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. Um, and it's talking about how perfect love allows us to have boldness in the day of judgment. Mm-hmm. And so I think that if we if we realize we don't have to fear because God loves us mm-hmm. unconditionally. Yeah. You made a, a good statement that we sometimes think we're not good enough. And really, we don't earn the grace that was bestowed on us. That's not the point, though. Grace was bestowed on us so we don't have to worry about being righteous enough. Did I see a hand over here? Alan? I'd like to read uh, Romans 5, uh, verse 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained at that by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings produce endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God, love, has poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the young brother. It speaks to that peace. I mean, that's the word that was used, that peace of God that we have because of that sacrifice. I think that's a good, a good point, a good scripture along this, these lines of these discussions, or the lines of this discussion. To think about the peace of God because we are justified because of God's bestowal of grace. Almost, well, it was an abundant bestowal of grace. I mean, you can't think of any higher price that could be paid than that God himself would sacrifice himself for our sins. And so if that is the danger that we are prone to, if we are drowning in our guilt, drowning in the guilt of our sins, as as Alex said, realize that God has banished those sins from his mind. There's a verse, uh, I can't remember the psalm, but it says, as far as the east is from the west, so are our transgressions from the Father when... He forgives us. And that might be in the prophets, but I think it's in the Psalms. But that image of, of God forgetting our sins because of that grace in Christ, we, can't, we don't need to have fear, as Elaine said. We're, oh, Gordon, go ahead. Yes, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, starting from verse 9, it lists several conditions that people were in, but it says, well, just real quick, let me read. Do you not know that the uh, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of heaven? But it goes on, it says, And such were some of you, it named off drunkards, revilers, homosexuals, thieves, all of those, but they have been cleansed. And so the grace of God, just, that's a list of, Horrible things. Yeah. But they were cleansed and they were forgiven of those things. Even as horrible as we might think they are, and sin is horrible, but 
God's grace is great. Steve? I was just going to add one more thing. You know, uh, th- this is sort of meaty stuff here. You know, and for, for, uh, for a babe in Christ or a Noah who might just be here today, you know, uh, that, that, that could be the very something uh, deep that they're not quite sure of stuff. And so it takes, you know, understanding, reading, and knowledge, and talking to other people about this grace that, that we receive. And, you know what I mean? Because, uh, I mean, it is a deep situation. And, then it, and it's, a, it's a life and death situation. We have to learn from, from making mistakes and, and sinning. You know, that, you know, we just, we got to learn, you know, we don't keep going back and doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. You know, we got to realize that master the sin that is in our lives. That's a great point. And I think that brings us to a good cap for our discussion. Um, talking about conquering our sin because of this, of this price. There's a good discussion in, in 1 Peter when he's talking about holiness he says, in the verse before, he says, live throughout your stay here in fear, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And so, when we think about the price that God has paid for us, the logical response to that is to offer our lives in return. The, the proper response to that, that ultimate sacrifice is our ultimate sacrifice. Jason talked in a few lessons ago, well, several weeks ago, about the greatest love language, that is dying to yourself. And the greatest love that we can show to anyone, as Alex mentioned, is laying down our life for a friend. And we can do that in return to Jesus' sacrifices. We lay down our lives, whether as we live, or if it, if it requires it, that we, live, let, that we lay our lives down and lose our lives for Christ. So as we, as we think about the price of grace and what it cost God to free us from our sins, let's ask if we are using that grace to overcome sin. Really, that's the discussion in mind here as we think about grace, how we can overcome sin. And, and that price was enough to, to free us from those sins. So let's think about that this week. And as Stephen mentioned, of course, this is nothing that we should ever stop thinking about or stop meditating about. Thank you for your kind attention and your, your comments this morning.